so it Jay's Fitness one two three. That's the affiliate name for Ackerman's Gym. Jay's Fitness. I like that. Jay's Fitness one two three or Jay's Fitness. Jay's one two three. Why not? Three two hey, one. You, go Jay. One or just one two three four, and that way you can just have that number go on and on as you begin to open up nine more affiliates, and you just go one through nine. Jay's Fitness one two three four five six seven eight nine. I'm going to do A1 Fitness. You remember how back in the day there would always be the A1 because it was first in the telephone book? <laughs> no. I'm going to do A1 Fitness. Oh, that's awesome. So in, in your imaginary affiliate where you'd have lots and lots of It's not an members. affiliate. Don't call it that. It's a gym. Is or it? he's going to franchise yeah. it. I'm de-affiliating my, my fake affiliate. He, your he's going to he's going to franchise it. You have to have one Peloton bike. You've got to have two different sets of bands for bicep curls. And then what do you use a 25 pound kettlebell? Is that your fitness routine right now? 24, 24, 24. pound. It's 12 kilo. Yeah. Something like that. Let's actually talk <laughs> in the real world. Since Jay likes to live in the fake world. What, what was the large, what were the largest glasses not like the largest class you ever had, but like what were on the regular, what was the largest class you had at any of your affiliates? You mean at the three affiliates that you stone? One sure. of those? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, the five, six, seven, we, you know, would oftentimes be 24 plus. Is that AM or PM? P, uh, PM, but also the morning class, the busiest times were like the 545 was probably regularly around 20 noon can get really busy and then evening classes jam-packed and that, that's not including people doing their own stuff over in the other areas so in so just pick one let's just say it's the 6 p.m class what that was regularly 25 20 yeah i mean i don't know off the top of my head but very busy busier than a normal class and then to consider the class before and after were also really busy so you just as you guys know it's it's those overlapping times where the gym is just packed. So what were some things that you would take into consideration? The, the reason I'm asking is because a lot of like, uh, at least I was at dinner with a couple affiliate owners here locally the other day and everybody's seeing an influx of people. So, and I, and I know that's actually not, uh, this is not a rare instance here. Like Virginia Beach, I, I know a lot of affiliates, are, affiliate owners that are seeing it, with the exception of a couple of places that are in complete lockdown or in chaos. Um, so a lot of people are seeing this influx of people. So it's not unrealistic to think that the people are going to have within I don't know 60 days of opening going to have larger classes, class sizes than when they closed. So what uh, yeah. were some of the things? So what were some of the things that you would take into consideration when? you had those larger classes because they're not the same. So like first and foremost, we, we all recognize that like the, whatever the, whatever your light class is for the day, that's not the same lesson plan that you execute for a 24 person class. Yeah. I mean, the, I think the most important thing we did over the years was just expanding the space and getting enough equipment. I mean, we had a humongous rig. We had probably 30 or more barbells, you know, t tons of bumper plates. So obviously just having enough equipment, which I wouldn't say is mandatory because you can be smart about how you run those classes. But the, the other important thing that I think we did when you're asking specifically about that was based on the time of the busier classes, we had more assistance. So there were oftentimes those evening classes would have the head coach could be me or one of my other head coaches and two or even three assistants helping out with that class. So that was probably the thing that we did specifically to address those busier times. All right. So then there's two questions on that. And Todd, you can hop in here whenever you want, because I know you guys have are like on average, like 15 plus in your classes right now. The, so there's two things there. One is I have the ability to put additional staff on the floor. We'll save that one for a second. So the first one is if I'm the only coach on the floor, then what are some things I need to consider in order to effectively coach a class, right? So let's delineate between I'm there to run a clock and people do fitness, and then I'm there to actually coach and improve people's movement and make sure that they understand threshold training, move better, all that stuff. Jay? Either one of you, yeah, feel free. Yeah, to take it, Todd. Go ahead, Todd, I've been talking. <laughs> 
Um, well, I mean, I think we've talked about this a lot before, but what's going to give you the ability to actually coach is making sure that your, your workout's set up to where it's like, you've got time to warm them up. You've got time for the, the specific warm up or the skill that you're teaching and then the workout itself. Um, but beyond that, so making sure that you probably only have one part of your workout, or at least if there is an extra part, that extra part can lend itself, you know, to, to the same teaching in the strength portion that goes into the Metcon or whatever, however you guys are trying to do it. Um, the logistics of how you set things up and put your, put yourself in position to see people. And then also for the class to flow is going to be a, a, a big piece of that. Um, you've got to make sure that you've got a game plan for where not only your athletes are going to be, but where equipment's going to be set up, whether it's with your athlete in their stations, or if there's going to be one central location in the gym for the extra equipment, maybe you're using boxes or something like that for box jumps. Is there enough boxes that everybody can have one over at their station? Or is it going to be like they're in the middle of the gym, the athletes are to the outside, and then they're going to cycle through and use those things? Um, just when they get to them in the workout and that kind of stuff. Um, so it goes, I think it goes down to stuff we've talked about before, which is going to be your lesson plan and, and planning for the logistics of um, the setup, the flow, the setup of the, the gym floor, and then the flow of the workout specifically. And I think nowadays it's a little bit more critical and more interesting because there's less either likelihood of using the same like athletes sharing equipment you know before all this stuff happened it's like hey we've got call it eight rowers and you've got 16 people in class let's just stagger it to where some people can start on the rowers, some people can start off and then they flip back and forth well now if we're trying to avoid sharing equipment um one are you going to be able to run that exact same workout um and two, that I, I guess that, that lends itself to figuring out how to program in such a way to where the, that's not needed. What, and I, and I realize this is an absolute moving target, but what are some of the things that you consider? Actually, two-part question. First one, have you ever just been standing at the whiteboard and then made the call on, right there on the spot before giving the brief. You're like, I'm changing the workout based on the number of people who are standing in front of you. That's the first one. So that's just. Oh a yes yeah. One. Okay. Yeah, yeah, lot, lot, yeah. That's happened quite a bit where it's like, you start to talk and you get ready to talk about the workout, and then in, instead of saying, "Hey, the workout is 21:59 of call it rowing calories and muscle ups," it's like, "Hey guys, today's workout. We're doing some rowing. We're doing some muscle ups, and then I'll tell you how that's going to go down once we get there." Oh, right. okay. So. You yeah. I, we we did that a handful of times at the gyms, but more recently when, when I was coaching at North Naples CrossFit, and as they grew, I found that they did that a lot, especially in the bigger classes. And I think something that could be talked about is when is the right time? It's not just because all of a sudden you have enough people, you're overwhelmed. It needs to be like, no, this truly cannot be run during this hour, given the number of people and the pieces of equipment. But I would get frustrated a lot when they would do it if it was a class I was in. First of all, if your coaches are taking class, kick them out. If you have that busy of a class, don't let them take class, right? Potentially. Potentially, or let them jump in to, to help. I think that's, that's right. a, like goes back to what we talked about before is like if you have extra people that can help jump into class or like help coach class, that's, a, that's an opportunity to do that. Yeah, but they would just, you know, be like, Oh, there's 12 people and we have five rowers changing it up. Imam this, or like Todd said, you know, we're going to, and it wasn't a big deal. You always got a good workout, it, but you know, but it was just, you come into class because you want to see what's on the board. You want to compete with those people. And now all of a sudden you're not, you're doing your own thing. You don't have a goal to shoot for necessarily. You know, you don't, you don't have that same desire to push yourself. So that's what I was going to say. It kind of is a big deal because a, if you do, if you make that change, we'll call it prematurely. If you make that change prematurely, when you don't really have to, instead of getting creative and and playing with any number of alternatives, whether it be a stagger start or, or something of that nature, people get aggravated because there's there's always a handful of people that came in. They're like, no, no, I wanted to do that workout. Like that's what I literally right. showed up for here today. Like, and now I don't get to do that, and now I'm a little salty about it. 
right? So like, I agree with you, like there's, that would always kind of rub me the wrong way if a coach would change it. And you could, you could absolutely tell that the change was made because they were overwhelmed and hadn't thought about a plan B yet. They're just like, well, I'm just going to change it. And we're going to do something different. So I, so I think that for me, I would agree. And I don't remember which one of you said it, but I, I think, no, I think it was you, Jay, that, that it should only be changed once you come to that conclusion. Like this is not feasible anymore. Like we we literally cannot run this class the way that it was designed. That's when you change it. Like there's just like, it's either a safety hazard or you just like, there, there's no amount of equipment that would solve this problem that you have access to. That's when I think you change it and go from there. Um, and that, but if you can, I think you should try to stick to it. Um, unless, unless you look at, then I think there's just weird scenarios where like you look at it and you're like, you're right on the cusp and it's something that just kind of perfectly matches up. And if I made this a partner workout, it's actually more fun. That way. And I'm like, okay, yeah, but, but, but yeah. you're still, you're still ending up in the same, same thing there where people don't get to do it as written. So if you're going to have that argument, it's like, okay, if, if, you know, you have an athlete like Jay that's Mr. Rx and needs to do everything Rx and can't, like, he's not there just to get fit. He's there to compete and lose against somebody else. Then that person's going to have an issue. Um, no matter how you switch it up, it, it, that is essentially what I took away from your, your comment there. Kind, uh, well, kind of, I, I, there's a limited number of scenarios where just making the, the judgment call to change it. That's not based on safety or equipment actually makes the workout more fun. And it's usually completely just, it's pure dumb luck. So this is not something you could tee up beforehand. The, as I said, there's a, there's a one offer just like, Hey, this would be an awesome partner workout if we changed it and made some slight changes to it but other than that i agree with you todd 100 percent. like you're it's it's worse off my and my it, point was just if you're gonna change it don't do it because all of a sudden you're stressed that to me shows you're not coming to class prepared to have a full busy class if you're see, just I, like wow there's so many people i gotta change it do the math talk to another coach if they're there send them off on a 400 meter run to give yourself two minutes to, to think don't just and, and I'm not trying to throw these guys under the bus. There was just a period of time where I felt like it was happening every day at the five or six o'clock class. And it was just like, it became the norm versus, Hey, we need to solve the problem of either our programming or, yep. or need a backup plan. we need a backup plan rather than, you know, or, or, Hey, we're not programming, programming assault bikes right now while we only have four, like oftentimes it was, and they were following uh, NC fit at the time. And it was like, maybe we can't follow them because they're programming for gyms that have eight, 10, 12 assault bikes and we have four. So now all of a sudden, every time that comes up, I was like, we need to realize we're not going to do this. Like we're just being dumb now. Yeah. Well, you create a, you create an unnecessary friction point because there's a lot of things wrong with that. And typically the way it happens is, and I've been guilty of this, where that if you're using somebody else's and you don't look at it beforehand to make the change because there's always the person that comes in, well, it says assault bike. So why are we going to row when you could just change it beforehand? Because you're like, I don't have enough assault bikes to facilitate that. So why am I going to cause myself to, to have this yeah. weird, un unfortunate interaction with somebody and make them aggravated? Like, that's my fault. That's not them being a jerk. Like I was lazy and didn't change it to, to avoid that conversation. Exactly. It just a little, a little proactiveness, a little being, you know, aware of what's going to happen goes a long way. Okay. So the second question, go ahead, Todd, you had something else. Oh, I was just going to say, it kind of falls in line with the programming piece is there's only a couple workouts and more importantly, a couple pieces of equipment where that's going to be an issue. Right. And it's the things that we've referenced, the salt bikes, the rowers, potentially the rings to where, like if you know you've got a limited number of that, you need to be prepared for the worst possible case scenario going into the day, not prepared as a coach, but as the person who's green lighting the programming. Like I remember when we started and had a space that was 1600 square foot on the days where I knew there'd be 20 people in that space. I was like, I had to program workouts that I knew we could do. And, and I, it wasn't just like, well, let's see if 20 people show up at 5.30. It was like, I'm going to assume that 20 people are at 5.30. So I'm going to write the entire day's workout to be something that can accommodate those people so that we don't have the issue of half the class is doing one thing and then the other half having to do something different. Um, and the other thing that I found is like, you guys are making mention of people switching, coaches switching the workout too soon. 
I always found that like more inexperienced coaches were more likely to stay true to what the workout was, even if it was going to be super clunky and not go well. Whereas the experienced coaches, like I would find myself would be one that would be quicker to change the workout because I could logistically figure out a way to make it still go down um, without it really impacting the class too much. So a couple other things I think just to consider in those scenarios. No, I, I think we agree. I, I think probably too soon is probably the wrong phrase. Just like changing it for the wrong reason, I think is more, I think what Jay and I were referring to is that I, yeah. I'm changing it now because I'm overwhelmed and overwhelmed right. and un, unprepared, not because I just like, no, I think, I think if you can get ahead of the game and change it shit the night before, that's, that's yeah. best case scenario. Right. Now, more importantly, so let's go to the second part of this because I think we've, we've, and we've covered that topic a little bit. Uh, before the how do you effectively use a second coach like what is their purpose and how do you actually make sure that that person has value on the floor we've seen it where this person just kind of roams around and they're and are and they're almost like creepy they're they're like jay they're just yeah walking around like why is that dude staring at me all weird you know touching me yeah <laughs> why is he giving me a tactile cue during the during the whiteboard brief I'll tell you, I'll tell you the most important thing I did with assistant coaches and interns or whatever you're referring to them as. First of all, I think it's really important if if you're listening to understand as the head coach in that class, it's your responsibility. I saw a lot of friction and a lot of frustration by my head coaches when the interns weren't doing enough, but they're interning or they're assisting because they're not as good as you. So they need to have a lot more direction. Sure, you'll get a hand few that are very proactive, but sometimes, you know, like Boz says to us at the games, misplaced action is worse than no action, right? So we don't want that either. So first thing is you have to have at least five minutes before class where you talk to them about something. Hey, this is the workout. This is what my timeline looks like, et cetera. And ideally that's happening ahead of time. The, the most important thing I started doing is you guys know of the um, – What's the, I think it's called the Pomodoro rule, the 80-20 rule. I don't know. Okay, keep going. So I know what the 80-20 rule is. Yeah, so there's that rule out there where it's like, you know, 20% of X will, will, will cause 80% of this, you know. So, for, for example, um, you know, 20% of your members are, are giving you 80% of your income. Something along, yeah. you know, they're, 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 for, all, for all sorts of things. But this, it works both ways. 20% of your members in a class will be 80% of your work and stress. And we all know who those members are, right? It's the newer people. It's the, it's the people that we joke about that come in and they're like, what's a thruster? So I would always say, let's, let's use uh, one of my interns. I would say, Allie, Allie, you take Donna, Diana, and uh, Sarah, and you coach the hell out of those three people during this class. Forget everything else. And that just gives me so much more bandwidth for the rest of class. That's probably, if you've never thought about it like that from a coach's perspective, that's what you should be doing. You know, give them well, one gives, rack or whatever, whatever yeah. the workout is that day. It yeah. gives them that undivided attention, but it also allows you as the, as the head coach to coach your good athletes who get ignored because you're over there dealing with the people who need a lot of, uh, of scaling or, or who rightfully so so this is not we're not knocking on people who are inexperienced like they need and deserve that attention however everybody else needs and deserves attention as well so you have to figure out how to solve both problems uh simultaneously so so, and it does and it does a few things it it gets that coach better too because now they can really focus on group training you know a specific task and those call it three women or four or men it doesn't matter they oftentimes you know they're they're let's say it's not that they're the inexperienced ones. It's they're the problem children or they're the needy ones. They're needy. They like, yeah, they like that attention. So they leave the class like, wow, I got so much attention. So that was a great class. Not realizing they were basically being babysat. You know, it's an interesting little sidebar on that is those, those people who are kind of, we'll call them like problem children, which is actually an unfair characterization of them. I think it is, if you just give them the attention, they most likely end up being your best clients. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, I agree with that. 
the they will, like, they will bring, they will be, they will be the ones where you could like, if you were to line them up, you'd be like, you could attach seven to 12 people that they are directly responsible for bringing in the door. So don't ignore them. Like you should actually figure out how to make sure those people get served because they will actually be like your, your mavens, if you will. Yeah. And I think those are those three people that I use are actually real people that are still at Albany CrossFit. So, I mean, that goes to show how long they've been there. Well, and I think you make a good point right there is that the typically the most challenging part of this is making sure that people get scaled appropriately and having the connection there. And so if you've got somebody, I, I think like you, you mentioned, if you've got an extra coach that's going to be on the floor and you give them directives so they know exactly who they're responsible for or what they're responsible for, that's the only way to really make that work effectively. But the other piece is if it's just you by yourself and you have those athletes walk in the door, like you can't be caught off guard by that. So number one, you need to expect, hey, these three people typically come at 530. I'm going to count on them coming in. And when they do, I'm already going to know what their scaled options are. I'm going to have a plan for that. So as soon as they walk in the door, the five minutes before class starts, I'm going to walk over to them and be like, hey, here's what I'm thinking for today's workout. You good with that? Cool. I'm going to write it on your own whiteboard. You keep this with you. Just remember by the time the workout goes, that's what you're doing. And then, and, and then if you can't do that before class, if you can find an area during class to do that. So if you do a warm up to where, you know, you've given your athletes, like you mentioned before, the 400 meter run or something like that, then it can be like, hey, Donna, why don't you ride the bike instead of the run? I want to talk to you about the workout. If you can cover that scaling stuff beforehand, then you've got that knocked out. And I think that's the biggest issue because most of the rest of the people, even though they might be scaled, it might be just smaller things like lighter weights or a couple less reps here and it's not quite as involved. So thinking through the scaling portion and finding the time to do that um, so that it's not a 10 minute break between the end of your build up and then the workout where you have to go around and try to scale people. Right. So the, it the sounds like we're, yeah. But it sounds like we're kind of classifying people, and this is good, into three categories. Like those that are just like they're here, they know what to do, they need to get the coaching, like Fern said, for for the better athletes. And that's something you should be able to do as the head coach while doing other things. Kind of the middle of the road people of let's just get them scaling. They know the movements, we're confident with their movement patterns, but I want them to get the intended stimulus. And then group C, kind of like you know, the quote unquote problem children. So if we kind of, if you come into class and you know the, those three categories and where those people are, you can, you can nip that early. Like for example, you know, someone's in that middle group and they come into class and you're doing Fran and you're like, Hey, I don't want you to go 95 today. I want you to go 75, but I want your goal to be to go unbroken. Boom. Now he's all of a sudden moved to category A. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. That's how you make a really busy class seem a little bit smaller. Yeah. And you can speak to those categories at the whiteboard brief. Yeah. And the, uh, the, the, the perfect place to do that in my experience is during the transition. So like during, like make the, when they, when you have people get equipment, right, you pull those people aside who, you know, need to be spoon fed some information and right there while everybody's pulling out barbells or getting kettlebells or wall balls, like you pull them to the side, be like, I need you to get X, Y, and Z and then meet me right back here. I'm going to give you exactly what you're going to do. And that's how, and that, and nobody knows, nobody's the wiser because nobody else saw that interaction happen because everybody's doing their own thing right there. Yeah. Um, what are some things that, that assistant or interns or whatever, what are some things they should be aware of? like just awareness type things. So we're always thinking in terms of the head coach. If I'm an assistant coach, what are some things that I should be aware of that either A, could that I could unintentionally cause problems for the head coach or how could I be more useful to the head coach who may not know any better, right? Like, so how, how can I, how can we arm an assistant coach whose head coach doesn't know how to use them appropriately? Here's a really low hanging fruit. Assistant coaches, let's take those same categories. Say we got those three women and they're, we're doing a pull-up workout, and it's like we know they're going to do ring rows. Like, I've seen this happen. Like, you set up the rings in the available spots for, like, RX pull-up bars or the muscle-up rings that we need. So it's like just be a little smarter. Like, hey, they're going to scale. Like, let's keep them out of the way of the people that need this RX equipment. Or, you know, the workout's 95, and they take the 25s and put them on a training bar. You know, little little stuff like that. Just being a little yeah. more – 
aware of your surroundings. Like that, that'd be step number one, grouping those people together. You know, so for example, you know, uh, towards the end of those busy classes, we had the rig, but it might, and if the rig's totally full, like the girls that are going lighter on say a squat, go get them the individual squat stand. So the dude squatting 405 doesn't have to try to walk it back without tipping over the, the, the squat stand, stuff like that. I think, I think the awareness is the big piece. And to, to add on to that is like, keep your eyes open to where your head coach is. So there's no point if your head coach has gone and talked to a specific athlete, assume that they covered all the important stuff and you don't need to go and talk to the same athlete. Same deal. If it's like you guys are trying to make your way through the specific warm up and make sure that everybody gets a cue. Well, if you just keep cueing the athletes in the same row and then the other side of the class, no one's there. It's like try to always be on the opposite side of the floor than, than where your head coach is, unless you're advised differently. But it's like that kind of awareness. It's like, yeah, you need to be paying close attention to your specific athletes, but also watch where your head coach is at and what he's doing and try not to duplicate the same thing. I think I, it can be nothing more frustrating for an athlete to get, you know, uh, some direction and guidance from you, Jay, as the head coach. And then as soon as you're done, Fern comes over and is like, all right, here's what I want you to do. And it's either different or contradictory to what your head coach said. And the athlete's like, what the hell do you guys want me to do? What's like, who's in charge here? And now this is yeah. confusing. That's one thing the we do really is, well at, at level ones. Like we all, there's been, I mean, you've done it. We've done it where it's like you walk up to someone and very quickly realize there's a red shirt there. And you're just like, got it, move away. Yeah, move on. Because I've, I've been on both ends probably, but you know, it, it'd be like, Hey, try taking your feet wider. Then the next coach is like, Hey, why are you so wide? And then you can frustrate somebody, you know? So it, it, that, it, that is important. It's not always easy to do, but that goes back to early on where you're like, Hey, say we're, say we're doing a, a snatch day and we have like five rows of five, you know, Fern, you take that row, Todd, you take that. Like that's what we do at level ones, right? Hey, we have zone defense, if you will. Um, I don't know. Fern can talk more about that D one basketball player. But wow, we all do. it's always a man to man guy. So. <laughs> but <laughs> that's what that's what Jay is too. For sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, the point is, yeah, you don't want to over coaching can be just as bad, if not worse, than under coaching. That's that's so that I agree with both of those. So that just general awareness of what's going on, but also like being proactive and trying to anticipate. Like, if you're an assistant coach, like you should probably be pretty in the loop about what sh what is going to happen in that hour so if there's dead time and you need to move equipment don't stand around with your finger up your butt like get that stuff moved and if let's it's probably a safe assumption that if we have an assistant coach on the floor it's probably a big class so one of the things that it can be frustrating from a head coach is if the assistant coach is not paying attention when one of their main functions is to help herd the class along and you're over there bullshitting instead of like shuffling and making people hustle a little bit more. So remember having the wherewithal to know like my, one of my main jobs here is to kind of like make sure people get where they need to go and do so expeditiously. Like, you know, so I, I think just that awareness of like, all right guys, like, or just do, do stuff for the members. Be like, Hey, I already got your barbell, right? Everybody's ready to go. And all the coaches like, Oh, like we're ahead of schedule now because you actually like got some shit done. Um, yeah, you know, like well, you're, just, you're like an assistant waiter or waitress or server. You know what I mean? Take take it back to the level one. Think about one of the things we say every Saturday morning is when a red shirt is talking, you shouldn't be talking. And it's kind of the same principle, right? Like, you, you know, you should be part of the problem is often a lot of interns, assistant coaches are there because they enjoy hanging out with their friends and bullshitting. And so I guess going back to being the head coach, it's deciphering who those people are versus who really wants to be here to coach, not because they're either getting a free membership or now they're the cool kid in class. So, you know, making sure when the head coach is about to make an announcement about the next phase or what's coming up next, you're part of the action, not, not causing more stress. Or just like pulling people in if the head coach didn't have the wherewithal he's yelling across the room just like pull people in real quick be like yeah. hey guys over here real quick you know jay's got to say something it's probably not important but we'll listen <laughs> anyway and then we'll pull him back out um 
that's the stuff that I think where like assistant coaches can be most useful. It's just like helping the organizational structure of a class and making sure that as the group gets larger, that we can still move as efficiently from A to B to C to D, whether whatever it is going on there. Um, but no, I agree. One of the I, somebody did write us uh, a while ago asking about talking over another coach, and I, my answer was very brief. It was just no, don't do it ever. Don't do, don't do it. And, and that goes both directions, right? So I think this is important too. As a head coach, don't squash assistant coach. Like if they're talking, just let them finish. If you need to address something, address it off to the side, like professionally. But like, and then there's a, if you're the assistant coach, like if the head coach is talking, just be quiet and be like, hey, we'll finish in a second. And then just shut up. Yeah. That's something got- that's like super important. Yeah. I learned, yeah. I mean, you know, Years ago, when I was doing a lot of yoga training, one of the things that I remember was the guy that was teaching, and he's one of the best yoga people in the world. He was like, somebody asked him, like, what do you do when an instructor tells you to do it this way, but you know better? And he was like, as long as I don't feel like I'm going to hurt myself, I do it. And it's kind of the same principle, right? Like, your assistant coaches aren't going to know as much as you, but so long as they're not saying, like, hey, make sure your knees touch on this next squat, you know, they're not saying anything stupid, let them... The worst thing yeah. you can do is stifle them, and then they never talk. They never coach. Like, and then again, well, like yeah. you said, address it after. Hey, why did you tell them to take their stance wider? Like that might not have been wrong, but just why did you do it? Like, make sure they understand that aspect of it. Yeah, teach them. Would you, were you working with Bikram? <laughs> <laughs> I could I could see you wearing that little. Bird that is little on fire speedo. today, Todd. Bird <laughs> is I could see you wearing a little speedo. No, oh, yeah. I had a lot of pre. I had a lot of pre work. I, I trained and had a lot of pre workout before I feel like this you episode. Trained. Your hair's so. all sweaty. But, you worked out. Uh, I took. A, I took a shower. I took a shower. I'm impressed. Uh, you want to hear a funny story? Though. Listen, I've thinking. worked out. This is this is probably why I feel like I got hit by a truck. I worked out four times in five days. Ooh, overtraining. Um, yeah. Remember the remember it's the big Reebok for me. <laughs> yeah. shorts that we got in the in the trainer box that had like vents in the front, but also. And like the top of your ass crack area in the back. Like They're compression they shorts. Compression shorts, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So hold on. Hold oh, on. No, is, is, are you wearing those today? Oh, I am wearing them. Hold on. These right here. Oh, I'm get wow. up on this chair. Those right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you can see Fern's ass crack if you're watching the video. <laughs> and I remember one time going to a Beacon class, you know, it was maybe like a hot 26 or whatever at my friend's yoga studio. But, but you do it in your spandex. And I was like, I didn't realize it. And then the whole class, I was like, oh shit. I was basically wearing, you know, see-through pants the entire time. Yeah, Perfect. you're doing you're doing hot yoga in fishnet stockings. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, no, but that I I want I thought that was important just because uh, like our classes have been packed and and if you're going to continue to provide a a good service and good coaching. I don't care how good you are. And I think most people on staff would agree that like something between that 15 to 20 mark number of athletes is what I'm referring to is where even the best coaches become less effective. Yeah. yeah I'd say it's not fun. It's not as fun. 12 people is like a sweet spot. 15 plus is like you can do it, but it's not nearly as fun. Yeah. I'd say, there's definitely a number where I need to have X amount to make this class just energized. Right. And that's probably yeah. like eight, eight to 12, like that 12 to 20, like a level two, you're like, I got this, but I'm definitely on like full yeah, I need four, help. like, uh, but I'm on like a hundred percent. Like I'm focused. And then beyond that, you're just like, I'm trying to survive and not hurt anybody. You know, it, it's just yeah. diminishing, but I mean, I'd say yeah, what that's do you just think? A, you're just a safety person at that point. If you were taking yeah. the, you know, upcoming L4, assuming it comes out and it's like you had to coach a class and pass, what number would you feel confident coaching up to and still getting a pass? Obviously the lower the better, but like say like, hey, there there's benefit to coaching more people. I would so I would still feel comfortable with right, but I'd still feel comfortable with 15. I'd still feel pretty I think confident. I could do 15. But much well, more over that. Like twenty to twenty-four. You don't think you guys can handle that? I mean, I think no, I could, I, but but I to be one hundred percent confident. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I know I could. Yeah, you but don't like it. Would there would be a, there would be a I would there'd be a quantifiable diminish diminishing 
uh, return on that? Like what well, my ability to see incorrectly. In, in, inevitably, it? some people get lost in the shuffle. Now, True. Jay, True. for 24 people or 12 people or eight people, you're just kind of running the clock and pointing at the whiteboard anyway. So it doesn't Playing matter. Playing some good 80, 80s rock. The, yeah, that's, <laughs> he's, listen, he's that's exactly what I was going to say. The, the, most, the most important thing Jay is doing in that hour is DJing. Be like, hey, guys, you want me guys yeah. want me to switch this up? Yeah. That, that needs to be the next ineffective coaching. You know, we do like the cheerleader, the overcoacher, the Fucking DJ. DJ. God. <laughs> but I mean, it's important for those listening to hear like, you know, three people that have not only owned numerous affiliates, coached thousands of hours, worked on seminar staff. We're saying, you know, 15, maybe 20 at the absolute max for a top class. How many people are listening and realizing they're coaching way more than that with way less experience? And most likely doing a lot more in that hour than at right for drive. Just goes to show. Yeah, yeah but I mean, it's just one of the, you can only control what you can control. Right. right. Yeah. So the point, the point is, is, is just awareness of like, okay. I, and again, it's one of those, and I think we talked about this before, which is, you know, James Hobart had kind of talked to me about this a while back, which is, listen, everybody messes up the timeline, but you need to know, preferably even beforehand, you're like, listen, I'm going to, there's going to be some hiccups here because there's now 32 people in the class. So what can I do to mitigate that moving forward? But if you're just ignorant and unaware that you have a problem on your hands, that's where this becomes uh, really devastating from, uh, from a member experience standpoint. And I think members at some point understand, like there's a number where they're like, wow, this class is busy. I need to be proactive and not be part of the problem. Right. There's, you know, not, not my members. They well, just like, feed off. It's like, they're like, they're like, riders. Also, it just gets worse and worse. And let me, let me, I mean, I know we're wrapping this up, but let's just throw in there. There's, there's like the Monday through Friday, this was a busy class. And then there's the Saturday morning class. That's like potentially 30 or 40 and everyone's yeah. just there to have a good time. Yeah. Like yeah. That's where it's like, I'm not trying to be the best coach. I'm trying to keep everybody injury free. And I want everybody just having a great community experience. And there's a difference there. But if you're doing that Monday through Friday, and you know, the difference also is everyone's in the same boat at that class versus if you do it a Monday through Friday, there's people that got a really good experience at 3 p.m. but then shitty at 6 p.m. Yeah. Yeah. And that some of that, and we 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 had talked about Cassie and I had talked about this uh, a while back. It just we were I don't say over programming on those Saturday classes, but we were putting in things that should not have been on that day, you know, like complex movements where it's just like, listen, we are shooting ourselves in the foot for no particular reason at this point. Like, let's just stop doing that. Yeah. Saturdays need to be either some sort of team workout. So every four people only needs one piece of each equipment, you know, medicine ball, barbell and a box, but rather than having 50 out, all of a sudden you only have 10 out and, or, just a body weight type of move, you know, like there's that hero workout. I think it's Laredo. Like that's a good example yeah. where it's like run, lunge, push up, go. Still a great workout, yeah. you know, but there's a difference there. A long grind. That's just very low skill. Correct. Yeah. Cool. I think that's a really good discussion. I just, A, maximizing the use of your assistant coaches and during busy, busy class times, but how to effectively coach those busier classes. Cause Everyone's about to get hit by those. Yeah, if not already, it's coming. And also, Todd had a shirt off this whole podcast, but we didn't address it. Yeah, Jay, I'm just trying to be like you. I thought that was the rules. <laughs> you, I'm the Todd, only one wearing a shirt right now. Jay. I don't, but you were yeah. changing your clothes. I don't know what you were doing a minute ago. I saw your, I don't know, if his pants coming off or socks going on, what the deal was. No, I was, put, was I was putting I was putting shoes on because I came. I got directly out of the shower to get on to the podcast. Did you do uh, that slap wall behind you, Fern? I did. You're going to have to teach me how to do that in our new garage. You can actually buy some of this stuff pre-cut and then just What's piece that? it together. Just come teach him how to be a man. <laughs> oh, Roz just said, I heard that, Roz. <laughs> what Roz just said is teach him how to be a man. And I'm going to be honest with you, Roz. There is no, <laughs> no amount of teaching. That's, there is no amount of teaching that's going to help me help Jay to uh, you said there's no become a man. <laughs> but what were you going to say? You can buy that as is? Like in the yeah, you can buy like them in uh, like, I want to say pre-cut, like different lengths and stuff like that. And they basically just uh, fit together. Like if, but in our lounge, that one's different. So this one I bought, these are like prefabricated. The lounge that we have, which is, I don't know, three times as big as this office. We, we did that one from scratch. 
literally ripped apart, I don't know, a hundred pallets and then cut them all in different sizes and nailed them to the wall. That one took weeks. Yeah, looks, and, th and that, how do you do that? Is this just a nail gun or something to get that up there? Up here? Yeah. Yeah, just a nail gun. Or if you have just finishing nails, like depending on how much wall you're gonna do, you don't, you don't necessarily need a nail gun, but it's a hell of a lot faster. Garden City, CrossFit Garden City, Jen and Dennis had some really nice stuff that they did all from pallets. They can do some really nice stuff there at your box. We can talk about that in the yep. future. Jay, you can't talk about that because you ain't done none of that stuff. Yeah. You can bring somebody and, on to talk about it. And no, you have zero my, and you have zero man skills. That's one of my new goals in life is to get more man skills. Not happen. So come come to my gym, bro. I'll put you to work. <laughs> you cross a rife is a COVID hotspot. I don't want to go there. <laughs> I heard Trump mention cross a rife specifically. <laughs> yeah, he was like, "We're he's like they're doing it bigly there. Everything's happening. It's they're great. doing it right. Just don't <laughs> test there. You guys won't have yeah, any cases. Yeah. Not nope. a single person can go nope. and get tested. Not one case. Nope. If anyone's listening that can help me with my man skills, I'm interested. Anyway. Good episode, guys. I don't want to end it because I know we get some really bad feedback when I end the show. Todd, you want to take it out? You never end it. I'm good, man. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. How cool is that? There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so it becomes super simple. Some of these episodes with Fern or Todd or myself chatting with one another, we've done right within the app itself. Anchor will make it easy to distribute your podcast to all platforms, Spotify, Apple, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make an awesome podcast in one place. All you have to do is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Come on, who doesn't have Spotify at this point? And if you were unaware, Spotify now is offering podcasts. That's right, on Spotify you can listen to all your favorite artists but also podcasts in one place for free. Spotify has a huge catalog of podcasts on every topic, including the one you're listening to right now, best hour of their day. On Spotify, you can follow your favorite podcasts so you never miss an episode. Premium users can even download episodes to listen to offline wherever you are, something I always do before I hop on a plane. And you can even easily share what you're listening to with your friends on Instagram and other social media platforms. Here's the deal. If you haven't done so already, be sure to download the Spotify app, search for best hour of their day on Spotify, or browse some other podcasts if you want. You can find them in your library tab. And also make sure to follow me so you never miss an episode of best hour of their day. Thanks again for listening to best hour of their day. If you haven't already, do us a favor, head over to the Apple Podcast app and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, concerns, feedback for either Fern or myself. Hit us up, day at gmail.com or send us a DM over on Instagram at day. Once again, we couldn't do this without the amazing community and you are a part of it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting best hour of their day.